combine some history with mystery and talk about the Lost Franklin Expedition. So ever since the um, Marco Polo ventured to the east and discovered the riches of the Far East, men had always wanted to find a faster, more secure way of getting there. Now, the only sea route available to Europeans was to either travel down the Atlantic and uh, around Cape Horn uh, at the bottom of South Af America or around the, the Cape of Good Hope at the bottom of South Africa. And both of these routes uh, posed numerous problems. Uh, of course, the weather at the bottom, at, um, the, uh, at the, both of these capes uh, was always severe and was, it was tricky to get around. Um, there was also pirates in the region, and the, the length of the journey meant that often crews were subject to illnesses like scurvy and typhoid and yellow fever and things. So that journey was, was very, very difficult. So for a long, long time, men, including great explorers like Frobisher and Parry and, and James Cook and La Perouse and dozens of other men, searched for a route uh, through what was known as the Northwest Passage to no avail. Now, the Northwest Passage was a mythical place. It was thought that people could get through this area and get uh, all the way across to the Pacific. Now, if that was possible, uh, it would be a huge bonanza for the country that discovered it. It would take about 6,500 nautical miles off the journey, which would mean months and months at sea. So an economic stimulus to the country that found it would be enormous. And Sir John Barrow... Uh, he was the man who was the second secretary of the Admiralty for 40 years from 1804. And he's the man that is seen by most uh, historians as being the person most responsible for the build-up uh, of the British Navy into the greatest Navy of its time. And uh, he was responsible for innovations in uh, ship design, uh, armaments, um, he made sure that there was uniform training right across the Royal Navy so someone could go from one ship and go to another position on another ship and he'd know exactly what to do. He was also responsible for making sure that promotions were based on merit and not on people's connections. And so he was very influential. And uh, he, had, uh, he was responsible for fighting the battles against Napoleon uh, and then he'd fought the uh, War of 1812 against the Americans, and then he'd also fought wars against the Dutch and uh, s uh, reduced their power as a great naval nation. And, but now uh, these wars were done, and it was the era of discovery, the era of exp exploration. And his greatest, his crowning glory was planned to be, uh, before his retirement, he wanted to discover a way through the Northwest Passage. And to do that, he decided to create the, uh, the best, the biggest, the most scientifically advanced, the best resourced uh, mission of all time to go through and discover that passage. And he had all the weapons at his disposal by this time. But to do it, he also had to have the right person to be in charge. And, um, but just to, before we get there, I'll just show you that, that this is um, the area that we're talking about, above Canada uh, and um, before we get to the Arctic. And each winter, the ice would flow down from the Arctic and block all those channels and those passages. But it was believed that in summer, when the ice uh, thawed, there would be a passage and you would be able to get their way through. So as I said, Barrow wanted to select the best person for the, the job to lead this, this great mission that he was going to undertake. He knew exactly who he wanted. Uh, but before he could offer the position to that man, he had to go through some protocols because uh, the greatest Arctic explorer of his generation, a man by the name of Sir William Edward Parry, um, was first in line. You had to offer it to him first as a matter of courtesy. Uh, Parry was... Uh, uh, as I said, a great Arctic explorer. He'd gone on several missions to the Arctic. Uh, in 1827, he, uh, his expedition to try to get to the North Pole got furtherest north than any other person had ever done before, and that record stood for over 50 years. But he was 60 years old now, um, and he, his exploring days were over. But as a courtesy, as I said, uh, he was offered the role, and as expected, he turned it down. He declined. So then that um, gave... Um, the opportunity to offer the job to the man that he really wanted to, to take on this mission. And that was Sir James Clark Ross. Now, he was your quintessential hero. He was um, 
a handsome, charismatic man, uh, very courageous. He had been on several, on four missions to the Arctic with Parry. Uh, he'd also been on missions to the Arctic with his uncle, Sir John Ross. And most recently, he'd um, travelled to, he'd been a leader of an expedition to the other end of the world, to the Antarctic, with two ships, the, um, the Erebus and the Terror. And this had been an extraordinary ex expedition, and they discovered a lot of things. He, um, he named Mount Erebus the southernmost volcano, active volcano in the world after one of his ships, and he also named Mount Terror after the other ship. And uh, in turn, uh, the Ross Sea, which is just to the south of us right now, uh, Ross Island, which is also to the south, and the Great Ross Ice Shelf in Antarctica is named in his honour. But... Um, but he had a bit of a dilemma. Um, he had just married this uh, stunningly beautiful woman and he'd promised her that he wouldn't embark on any more expeditions. And so when he was offered this role, he had a dilemma that he had to face. You know, do I go away with these smelly men uh, on this small boat for two, three, four years or do I stay home with my beautiful wife, raise a family and be the darling of the London society that I am? So, you know, what do you do? You have to weigh that up, don't you? So, in the end, he... Uh, uh, and he declined the offer as well. So, but he recommended his very best friend, uh, the man that he thought would be perfect for the mission, a man by the name of Francis Crozier. Crozier had been uh, on missions with Par uh, Parry and uh, Crozier had also been uh, the captain of the Erebus when he had gone to Antarctica. So he was a very, very well-credentialed man in his own right. But the problem was, and, and like we saw with Shackleton the other day, uh, Crozier was Irish. And there was no way that the English were going to allow an Irishman to get the credit for discovering the Northwest Passage. Um, I mean, uh, Barrow was, was one thing about promoting on merit, um, but it was another thing having a, a, an Irishman lead an expedition of, of this immense scope and importance. So he was knocked out for that reason and also for the fact that he was very low-born. He had risen through the ranks uh, of, the, of the Navy to get to this position. Uh, he wasn't one of the chaps. He didn't belong to the right club, so he was knocked out for that as well. And so they went through uh, a few more people, a few more options, uh, and weren't satisfied with them. But uh, until they came across Sir John Franklin. Now, Lady Jane Franklin uh, was a very, very influential woman in, the, in those times, and she had petitioned the Admiralty to, to select her husband to lead this mission. She wanted him to go down in history for his greatness. He had been born in Lincolnshire in England in 1786. He was the ninth of 12 children. His parents didn't have a television set, apparently. Uh, at the age of 14, he joined the Royal Navy, and it was only the following year, at the age of 15, that he fought at the Battle of Copenhagen along with Lord Nelson. In 1802, he was part of the circumnavigation of Australia along with Matthew Flinders, and that's another talk that I'll do um, after we leave Sydney. And uh, in 1805, he was a midshipman during the Battle of Trafalgar, the Great Battle, along with, again, Lord Nelson. And then in 1819, he was selected as a lieutenant to lead what was known as the Copper Mine ex um, uh, Expedition. It was a Royal Navy expedition, but it was going to be overland. It was going to start in the Baffin Bay area of Canada and go overland to the north coast of Canada and explore that north coast. So once again, uh, survey that to see whether there was a route through there for the Northwest Passage. But the mission itself was very poorly resourced. He only had three other men from the Royal Navy, and the plan was that he was going to get to Canada and recruit local trappers and, uh, and hunters to be part of his team. But when he got there, um, when he explained the mission to these men, uh, they refused to go. The experienced trappers, the, uh, the ones that he really wanted, weren't interested in going based on what he told them about the mission uh, compared to what they, the British were prepared to pay for their services. So he could only recruit inexperienced men. And this was become a problem. So he set out in 1819 with 20 men to uh, go on this mission. Now, from the get-go, things were very, very tough. Um, they were supposed to average about 18 to 20 miles per day. But Franklin insisted on stopping for tea. 
every few hours. So by the time they built fires and unpacked um, um, their equipment to make the tea and then packed it up again, uh, it, there was constant uh, delays. And um, Franklin was later said to be very unfit and they very rarely made more than eight miles per day instead of 18 or 20. So the going was very slow. They quickly ran out of food and the, the local trappers that they'd employed were supposed to live off the land and, and uh, hunt for game, but they didn't have that experience to do so. So uh, after a very short while, they were eating off bugs and insects and things like that. Um, they went um, further north, and eventually the, um, the, the trappers that were with them uh, decided that they had enough and they wanted to turn back. Franklin told them that you're now members of the Royal Navy. This is a Royal Navy expedition. You under the, you're under the rules of the Royal Navy. If you, this is considered a mutiny. If you go ahead with this, uh, you'll be hung. Um, so they had no choice. They had to keep going. So on they went, and eventually they got to the north coast of Canada. Um, and there was supposed to be a food depot dropped for them. A ship was supposed to come in from the Pacific and drop food off, but that, hadn't, that ship hadn't been able to get through the ice pack, so there was no food for them. Now, you'd think at this stage, in the desperate situation that they were in, that Franklin would say, OK, well, let's, you know, common sense, let's go back. But he didn't. He still insisted on following his orders and conducting this, this survey of the North Coast. Uh, it was a few weeks later that the, the trappers were desperately, they were... Um, they were eating moss and bark to supply themselves with, with sustenance. And um, so they revolted once again, and, and in the end, Franklin had to see sense, and he decided to turn around. And the return journey was even worse than the way up. Um, as I said, they were living on bark. Um, they they were very rarely found any food, and of the 20 men that embarked, 11 died uh, on the return journey, mostly of starvation, although one man was actually murdered and it was believed that he was cannibalised by at least one other of the, the men in that party. Um, Franklin got so desperate that he actually ate his boots, ate his own boots on the way back. And later on, he became known as the man who ate his boots. And uh, Charlie Chapman, uh, growing up in England, uh, remembered that story and uh, the story of Franklin. And in his 1925 classic movie, The Gold Rush, it tells the story of the little tramp who goes off into the wilderness of Alaska to seek his fortune. He's freezing cold um, and he's got no food and eventually he has to cook and eat his own boots. And that was based on, on Franklin. But um, eventually they were, uh, on the way back, they were discovered by a Native American uh, Indian tribe. Uh, they were given assistance, um, they were given food, and they were taken back to safety. Then the Canadian authorities were very, very critical of Franklin and his leadership. They said he wasn't fit to lead uh, this expedition. He, had, uh, he was inflexible with carrying out his orders. He had no common sense. Uh, he, he was foolhardy in what he had done. But when he got back to England, the British government was in a fairly critical situation. There was a crisis going on and they didn't need any more bad news. So the story was spun as being a great uh, heroic event and he'd uh, triumphed against adversity and, and struggled through the wilderness to, uh, against all, all odds and uh, survived. So he was actually promoted to captain and later on received a knighthood uh, for his efforts. He was later appointed in 1836, appointed as Lieutenant Governor of uh, Van Diemen's Land, which we now know as Tasmania. And when we get to Hobart, you'll see some of the, the evidence of, of Franklin there. And I'll talk about that a little bit later. And then in 1845, he was appointed Officer Commanding the British Naval Northwest Passage Expe uh, Expedition. Now, he was... 59 years old at the time, which was old for an explorer. That was, that was old back in those days, not like these days where 60 is the new 30, isn't it? Um, Crozier had accepted the role as second in charge um, of the expedition. He had really had no choice. He had no other employment that he could, he could go to. But Franklin at the time was an unusual choice because he was unfit. He'd been sick for quite some time. Um, so why was he going? Um, the authorities said he doesn't need to be uh, fit. He, um, he's always going to do his being on a ship the whole time and just sail through this passage. He doesn't need to get on the ice, doesn't need to do anything at all, so not a problem. These two men had actually met previously when um, 
uh, Franklin was Lieutenant Governor of Tasmania, or Van Diemen's Land. Crozier had been part of that expedition, the Ross expedition down to Antarctica, and they'd stopped off in Hobart. And Crozier had met and fallen in love with the niece of Franklin, the lovely Sophia. Um, the two of them were very much in love. Uh, Crozier proposed marriage to her on at least two occasions and uh, she declined. Even though she was madly in love with him, she declined. She wanted a husband that was going to come home to her every night, not go off to sea for weeks or months or even years at a time and be an explorer like um, she'd seen her uncle be. So uh, she later became the secretary uh, to Lady Jane Franklin for the rest of her life. She later had uh, poetry published and a lot of those poems uh, talk about the, the love of her life who went off to sea and never returned and it's based on Crozier. Um, they were going to be given two ships, the same two ships that had been taken to the Antarctic by Ross but these ships were going to be uh, reconfigured and redesigned. Now. HMS Terror and HMS Erebus don't seem like really, they seem like great names for warships, but don't really seem like great names for ships of discovery. Erebus is actually the name of the entrance to hell. So, and as you'll see later on, the crew of the ships probably thought that these became very appropriate names. Um, they, uh, they were going to be reconfigured, like I said, they were going to have four inch. Um, uh, steel plating put all the way around the hull of the ships to protect the ships from the ice. And in the bows of the ships there was going to be even more steel put in there so they could uh, push through the ice. It's wonderful new innovation was going to take place on these ships. Um, for the very first time they were going to have locomotive steam engines installed onto the ships along with propellers. So these ships would be able to be powered not just by the wind but by this, this new power of steam. And uh, they would be able to travel at four knots, which doesn't seem like very much at all to us. But at the time, this was brilliant because they could actually travel against the wind and against the current, and they could uh, manoeuvre, more importantly, through the ice if necessary and push against the ice. So this was an amazing uh, revelation. They're also going to have internal heating. So if the ship was stuck in the ice for, for a year, for a winter, then the crew would be very comfortable. And they'd be comfortable along with the fact that they were going to have about a thousand books each on each of these ships, a library there. So they uh, had things to do during uh, the times where they were stuck in the ice. Um, and one of the other great um, innovations that this, this mission was going to have for the very, very first time was uh, tin food. They'd invented how the, you could put food into a can and uh, preserve that and take it with them. So they were going to have three years' supply of tin food, so there was no need to go out onto the ice hunting for anything else or, or trying to find food. The food was all going to be supplied with them and they were going to take it along on this mission with them. So an amazing sort of, sort of find. Now, these ships were initially designed to be gunnery platforms and rocket platforms and they had been designed for the War of 1812 against the United States. And uh, HMS Terror, both of these ships had seen service in that war. HMS Terror was actually involved in the Battle of Baltimore. Now that was a fairly innocuous sort of, sort of battle. Uh, the British wanted to land troops at, in Baltimore and take the city. But the city was protected, the, the Bay of Baltimore was protected by a, a Pentagon-shaped fort in Baltimore Harbour named Fort McHenry. Um, now, to approach, you had to, to, the British would have to attack Fort McHenry, uh, bombard that and take that before they could take the city of, uh, of Baltimore. The Americans were being canny. They had sunk a couple of ships in the shipping lane leading to the fort. So the British had to stand off at the, ult at the, the maximum range and fire their cannons and their rockets at Fort McHenry from this maximum range, which was very, very inaccurate. And so on, on either side, there was only a couple of casualties. So as a battle itself, it wasn't very important. But um, a young lawyer from Baltimore had been invited on board the British ships to uh, arrange a, a negotiate a prisoner exchange. And that, um, uh, that young lawyer uh, conducted the negotiations successfully. Then he was invited to stay aboard the British ships and dine with the senior British officers. And then he was invited, uh, read compelled, to stay on board um, the ships uh, because he did, they didn't want him to disclose the, the details of the battle that was going to take place. So he had a fairly good, 
a bird's eye view of this bombardment of Fort McHenry. Um, and that's the scene from the bombardment. And of course, the man I'm talking about um, was Francis Scott Key, who uh, wrote, went on and wrote a poem about the, um, the which he named the, the, um, the defence of Fort McHenry. And in that poem, he mentioned the rocket's red glare, uh, the Star Spangled Banner, and years later, uh, that was put, there was music put to that poem and it of course became the American National Anthem, what we know today. So a little bit of history there. A little bit of trivia for you as well. Uh, Francis Scott Key's son was having an affair with the, congressman fr uh, the wife of the congressman from New York. The congressman found out about it and, and s uh, shot uh, Key in broad daylight in a park uh, with dozens of witnesses around him. Uh, he was arrested and uh, put on trial and he was the very first person in history to be acquitted on the basis of temporary insanity. So, there you go. Uh, also, in the third stanza of the poem that he wrote, uh, there's a, a line there that says, and this be our motto, in God is our trust. And of course, that's been shortened to, in God we trust, and it appears on all the, the American currency today. So the ship sailed from England on May 19th, 1845 with great fanfare. Uh, people were so excited about this mission. They couldn't wait for it to, to, to start and they couldn't wait for it to, them to come back. There was 24 officers and 110 men spread across the two ships. And if you read the newspaper articles at the time, there's no mention of if this mission, mission was going to be successful. It's all about when. Uh, and what would happen when they discovered the Northwest Passage, what it would mean to Britain, how long it would take to get for ships to get through to, to um, the Far East. Um, there was very, very positive stuff. The ships got to Disco Bay on the, off the coast of Greenland and the men wrote their last letters home. There was, um, and if you read through some of these letters, it's, it's pretty amazing too. That they're so positive about it. There's men... Um, uh, talking about how w what a wonderful leader Franklin is and how motivating he is to, to work with. And there was one a letter from a young midshipman who wrote back and he was complaining about the fact that um, he was disappointed that they, they were going to get this mission over and done with so quickly and discover the Northwest Passage so quickly that he wouldn't get to spend uh, any time in the Arctic. He wanted to spend at least one winter in the Arctic and he was lamenting the fact that he wouldn't be able to do it. Now, on the journey over to Greenland, five men were, were found to be unsuitable for the mission and they were discharged and sent home. Uh, and then on the 29th of July, 1845, an American whaling vessel uh, sighted the two ships, Erebus and Terra, as they headed into Baffin Bay into what was now known as the entrance to the, uh, the Northwest Passage. And the whalers later reported that the men of the ships lined the side of the ship uh, they were waving and they were cheering and they were singing and they looked very, very positive. And that, ladies and gentlemen, was the last time anyone saw Franklin and the 129 men aboard these two ships alive. So thank you. That's uh, the end of the presentation. <laughs> no, I wouldn't do that to you. We have to find out what happened, don't we? So Lady Jane Franklin, um, she was a remarkable woman, a very, very intelligent woman, a woman who's, who was said to have had great mental activity. Uh, while her husband was the Lieutenant Governor of, of uh, Van Diemen's Land, uh, she was the most popular woman in the colonies of Australia. Uh, she did a lot of work, charity work herself, and we'll talk about that later, uh, and she was the first woman to actually travel overland from Melbourne to Sydney. She bought 640 acres with her own money um, of land near in the Huon Valley near Hobart and she gave these, she split these up into farms and she gave this, this land to local men uh, with the intention that they would farm the land and, and hire other men, employ other people to, in the farm. And she encouraged them to plant apples. Now, the, a French expedition sometime earlier had planted a couple of apple trees in the region and these had flourished and she had seen these, so she encouraged the farmers to, to grow apples. And the very first export from Tasmania was apples. They were exported to the US and to uh, New Zealand. Uh, and now Tasmania is, of course, known as the Apple Isle. 
Now, after about 18 months, she went to the Admiral, after, since her husband had left aboard this mission, she went to the Admiralty and she told them she had a bad feeling. She had a premonition about uh, this. Things weren't going properly. And she asked the Admiralty to send a mission to search for her husband. And they just said, there's no need. There's, there's no problem. We, we, don't, we weren't expecting to hear from them for at least two or three years. They've got supplies for three years. Don't, you know, not a problem. Uh, but uh, as time went by, she got more and more concerned. And in the end, she actually funded seven missions, uh, expeditions of her, out of her own money to go and search for her husband over the, the next few years. And much of what we know about that region of the world right now is because Lady Franklin set these expeditions out and they gathered a lot of information about that region. Um, but uh, eventually, she did a lot of work. She... she um, uh, lobbied uh, the Admiralty, she lobbied Parliament, she went to the newspapers and caused a bit of a stir and eventually after about two and a half years the Admiralty thought that they had to act. And this is a, a painting of a group of the most senior uh, military, uh, naval officers and Arctic explorers of their, of their time and they're planning the rescue of, of Franklin and his men. And it's not a great photo but in the background there you can see a painting on the wall and that's the painting of uh, Sir John Franklin himself. The very first man to put his hand up and say, I want to go and search for these men, I want to see if I can find my very best friend, was, uh, was Ross. Um, he, by this stage, he had, uh, his wife had given him a son and an heir and uh, this kid was almost two years old and Ross couldn't get out of there quickly enough. If you... I know how he feels. Um, so he went searching with a, with a, uh, a flotilla of, of four warships to search for Franklin to no avail. And then the British Admiralty put out a reward of £20,000 for anyone who came up with any information about Franklin and his ships. Now, this is the equivalent of about £10 million in today's currency. So it was, it was a huge amount. And it meant that um, private ship owners from Britain and from the United States uh, sent ships to, to the area to search for Franklin. And that was the idea of it. But to, to no avail. And the very first time we had a clue about what had happened to, to the men was in 1850. So this was um, four years after Franklin had actually, four or five years after Franklin had actually left. And they came across a very remote place called Beachy Island. And on the Beachy Island, uh, it seemed that Franklin and his ships had wintered there of the winter of 45, 46. And there were three graves there. And these were the graves of uh, Petty Officer to John Torrington, Royal Marine Private Billy Bar Brain, and Able Seaman John Hartnell. So, but it asked more questions than it answered. There was no other information about what they died from. There was no information about where Franklin intended to go after he left um, Beachy Island. There was nothing. There was no clues whatsoever. Uh, it was an another mystery. And so the search went on. But it seemed that what had happened is that they'd wintered here at Beachy Island, which is just above the, the sign there that says Barrow Strait, named after Barrow, John Barrow I was talking about before. And then they'd um, turned south and they'd come down through here um, through this strait, and as they came down, the, uh, the ice followed them down. There was an early winter that year, and the ice, only a few weeks after they left Beachy Island, the ice followed them down and entrapped them again uh, at the northern part of King William Island, up here. Um, and once again, the men were entombed in ice for at least another winter. They tried to make the most of it. They went, um, uh, it's believed that they went out exploring and, and uh, seeing what they could find, but it was going to be another dismal sort of winter. Now, the next time that anyone found out any information about it was a man by the name of John Ray, who in 1854, so this is nine years after uh, Franklin had left, he was travelling, he was part of a mission that the Admiral had sent overland. So he was following basically the same uh, route that Franklin had taken during the Copper Mine Expedition. And he got to the north uh, coast of Canada and he came across some Inuit families. And uh, they had in their possession uh, some of the possession, possessions uh, that belonged to Franklin and his men. These were things like pocket watches, uh, uh, tobacco cases, uh, flasks, uh, um, 
military insignia, all these types of things, uh, even cutlery and plates. And some of them had um, the names of the person inscribed on the, on the item. And they were obviously from Franklin uh, and his men. And so uh, Ray questioned the, the, uh, the Inuits and they said that there was many dead white men on King William Island. So at least now they had a clue where, uh, where to go. And that, um, that the Inuit gave evidence to, to Ray about what had happened. And they said, they told him that on one occasion, two um, uh, Inuit hunters had come across 10 or 12 white men. The white men indicated that they were very hungry and the Inuit gave them some seal meat, which they ripped apart in their hands and threw down their throats raw. Um, the white men started pointing to the, the sled dogs of the Inuits and the Inuits became very concerned and frightened, uh, worried about their dogs. So they took off. They, they ran away from these white men. And you have to remember that this was a very, very barren country. There was nothing growing there. There was hardly any food source. And these Inuits were, were just uh, managing on the margins of survival themselves. Um, there was no way. They couldn't survive without their, their sled dogs. So um, they had to run away. And there was no way that even if they wanted to, there was no way that they could uh, provide enough food to feed these 10 or 12 other men for any, any period of time. Um, the, uh, the Inuits also told, uh, gave them evidence to say that uh, on some occasions they'd come across these white men and they'd been dismembered and some of their organs had been taken out and that they came across some other scenes where um, limbs had been cut off and there was bones in cooking pots and it was assumed that they'd resorted to cannibalism. Now, that was a very delicate matter and uh, Ray actually did a report giving all the evidence of the Inuits that he'd come across and he sent that report back to England uh, along with the, the note that said that his countrymen had been driven to the last resource which was cannibalism and when that report was released in London it caused an absolute sensation. Um, Lady Franklin was furious. Uh, she threatened libel action against anyone who published the report. Any newspaper that um, would print it, uh, she would go after with legal action. And she had the resources to do it. She also petitioned the Admiralty and, and, every, and uh, the government that Ray would not receive one penny of the reward money uh, that was entitled to him because of the allegations that he made. She couldn't believe for a second that her husband would have anything to do with cannibalism. And he never did receive any money from that, um, um, from that reward. Now the next, and, and all the information that he'd sent back about the evidence the Inuit had given was largely ignored by the Admiralty. I mean, these were, were savages. Um, why would we believe anything that they had to say anyway? They were, they were robbing the, the, um, the bodies of these men. But one man did read the report, and that was a man by the name of Francis McClintock. So he knew that um, there was something happening at King William Island. So he went there in 1859, 14 years after Franklin had left uh, England. So this wasn't going to be a rescue mission anymore. It was going to be um, a recovery mission or a mission of, of uh, trying to find out what had happened. And he uncovered, he found a can of stones uh, with a flag on top. And he dug into that can of stones and he discovered in a metal box there was a note. This note had been ripped out of a book, that, uh, of an admiralty book. And uh, there was a note inscribed on it uh, across there. And the note was from, from Franklin. And it said, 28 of May 1847, Her Majesty's ships Erebus and Terror wintered in the ice at latitude, blah, blah, blah. Having wintered at 46... Uh, seven at Beachy Island in latitude da da da. Now this was a mistake, by the way. Uh, it wasn't 4647. It was 4546. So why had he made a mistake? Um, having after having ascended Wellington Channel to latitude 77 and returned by the west side of Cornwallis Island, and it was signed Sir John Franklin commanding the expedition, and it finished with all well, all well. Now the noted. McClintock realised that the note had obviously been dug up again um, and more had been written on the note because around the outside of the, uh, of the letter that Franklin had written was another letter written by Crozier, which was a lot more ominous. It said, 25th of April 1848, Her Majesty's ship Terror and Erebus were deserted on the 22nd April, five leagues north-northwest of this, having been beset since September uh, 1846. 
The officers and crews consisting of 105 souls under the command of Captain Crozier landed here in latitude, uh, dot, dot, dot. Sir John Franklin died on the 11th of June, 1847, and the total loss by deaths in the expedition has been to this date nine officers and 15 men. And it was signed James Fitzjames, Captain of the Erebus, and F.R.M. Crozier, Captain and Senior Officer. And it ended with the note, and start on tomorrow, 26, for Bax Fish River. So this gave a clue as to what was happening. First of all, Franklin was dead. He, uh, he died only two weeks after writing the original note. And it also pointed out that they'd been stuck in the ice at this location for more than 18 months. Uh, and that the, they were going to try the Baxfish River the following day, go overland uh, 500 miles to the Baxfish River, which was, which was a huge endeavour. McClintock also and his men also discovered one of the boats, the lifeboats from one of the ships. And once again, this um, offered no clue as to what was happening. It asked more questions than it answered. The boat was pointing back towards where the ships had been. So had the men been trying to, to get back to the safety of these ships? Um, the other thing, there was two skeletons within the boat, and one was holding a rifle. And you'd think that if you were going to drag one of these very, very heavy boats all the way across the ice with you to try to survive, you would only take the bare essentials necessary for your survival, wouldn't you? But in this um, boat, they discovered some very unusual items. There was cakes of scented soap. There was hairbrushes. There was slippers. There was dozens of books. Um, there was um, 40 pounds of chocolate, which proved beyond any doubt that there was no women on this expedition because that would be the first thing that would go. <laughs> and they even found um, brass curtain rods in the boat. Why? I mean, why had they died of, died of starvation if there was 40 pounds of chocolate there as well? It just didn't make any sense. And as I said, it asked more questions than it, than it answered. And, and these are some scenes that were, were um, printed or, or painted by men back in, uh, in London once, or England once they heard these stories about what had happened. And it seems from what we know now is that they were lost, the ships were were grounded in the ice up here at the northern end of King William Island and that they tried to make their way around the, the western part of the island. Remember, that was all iced in. So where you see the blue there, there was no blue. It was all iced in. So they were trying to pull these, these um, um, boats all the way around. And we know that by the fact that they found, uh, researchers have, have found bodies all the way along that, that route. Um, it would have been very, very hard going. Now, a few years ago, um, a group of, it was an experiment um, made. Uh, 105 recruits from the Royal Canadian Mounted Police were asked to be involved in this experiment. Um, these were all fit young men who hadn't been stuck on a ship with no exercise for three years. Um, they uh, were nutritionally very, very sound. They wore the latest in, in lightweight uh, Arctic wear, and they were... There's a YouTube video showing this, actually. It's very, very interesting. They were having a hearty breakfast, uh, all joking and laughing amongst themselves. Then they were put on a bus and taken out to where three boats uh, were positioned. And these were boats with the same size and the same weight as the boats that Crozier would have had to haul across the ice. And they were put, some of them were put into harnesses to pull it, and some were put behind the boats to push them. And they were told to set off and get as far as they could. And... Um, Initially, they, they raced each other. There was a lot of joking and laughter amongst the, the, uh, all the men as they, they tried to race each other across the ice. And they came to some obstacles like some fissures in the ice and they had to try and haul these boats over and across these things. Uh, and then at this time, there was started to be a few injuries and people were, were shaking their fingers when they jammed their fingers. There was a few dislocated fingers. Uh, someone broke their collarbone. There were some scratches and things like that. Um, and then they were given a bit of lunch, a very, very quick lunch, and then they were told to get on their way again. And then at 5 o'clock in the afternoon, they were told to stop and uh, get back on the bus and go back to their headquarters. And there's the scene in this YouTube video where 
People went back and they were too tired to eat their meal. There was people asleep on the floor and under the tables. People slumped beside their meals, unable to have the energy to eat. And it was estimated that each one of them had uh, used up an average of 11,000 calories that day hauling these, these um, uh, boats across the ice. Now, I exercise and, and I find it hard to burn 2,000 calories in a day, let alone um, 11,000 calories. And do you know how far they got that day? Four miles. Only four miles. Crozier and his men had to go 500 miles to find the nearest blade of grass. They had to go 1,000 miles to find any form of civilization. They had absolutely no chance of survival. And along the route that um, they would have had to take, uh, as I said, there's, there's many bodies that have been found over the years. And some of these have been found in, in single uh, positions, some of them have been twos and threes, and, and some in, in more. And in some cases, they're lined up in, in rows, you know, very neatly, like they've been put into a tent and, and someone said, you know, we'll come back for you when we get help. Uh, and then some are just slumped all over the place. And um, in some cases, they have found uh, bodies with uh, nicks in the bones, which was obviously from a knife when their, their bones had been filleted. And they did find uh, bones in, in cooking pots and things. So there certainly was um, some form of cannibalization by, by some of the men. Um, and also a number of artefacts have been found um, um, by different people, the tobacco tin, um, a military, uh, a naval um, a badge, uh, pocket watches and things that have been found along the way. And even uh, China that was, that was taken has been found along that, that route. And then in 1981, the uh, scientists from the Canadian government were given permission to resume the bodies of the three men that were found on Beachy Island. And I'm going to put a video... A, a, picture up here in a second which shows uh, these uh, dead men so if anyone's offended by that you'd need to look away um, but these were the men, the Torrington uh, Hartnell and Billy Brain and this is the way they were found um, now they're in very very good condition because they were frozen in the ice for all that time and when autopsies were done on these men they found extremely high levels of lead in their tissue um, now London was a very polluted city at that time but even this wouldn't account for the high levels of lead that was found. So what had caused this? Now, also nearby, they found the tins that the food was to be put into for this expedition. Now, the, um, the tins were soldered with lead solder, and it seemed that these men had suffered from lead poisoning. Um, what had happened is that the company who had been given the contract to supply um, these tin meals had never had anywhere near the size contract that this was. was. Uh, it was a massive contract for them. They had to supply um, 130 men, with very hungry men, with three meals a day for three years. So it was a massive undertaking. Uh, they were given the contract on April Fool's Day, uh, 1845, appropriately. And they only had six weeks to fulfil the contract before Franklin was due to sail. So they had to hire in a lot of people, unskilled people, to solder these tins and seal them. And um, these men had no experience. And, and basically the, the, um, the lead solder was painted on these cans. There was lots of lead in the system. Um, and uh, the, the way that they would uh, heat this uh, food up would be to boil some water, put the cans in the water and leave it there for five or ten minutes to heat the insides up. And it said that when this happened, the, uh, the, the lead actually melted like candle wax into the food and it contaminated the food. And that's why there were such high levels of, of lead. And also the steam engine was using lead pipes throughout the, the ship. And they used some of that water in their daily diet. And that also impacted on the, uh, the amount of lead in the system. Now, the amount of lead wasn't going to be something that was going to kill these men, but it would really impact on their, their mental capacity, their thinking ability, their rational thinking. And so that's probably why some of these strange decisions had been made. It also impacted on their ability to fight other diseases off, and, and, um, and that could have had an impact as well. One of the ships that um, went looking for uh, Franklin and his men, there'd been a few expeditions searching for his men, and... Um, and then in the end, in uh, 1854, the Admiralty decided, decided to send their very best uh, ship, the uh, HMS Resolute. It was going to go across with a, a flotilla of four other ships and search for Franklin and his men. 
Um, when they got there, though, they, the Resolute got stuck in the ice, as did two of these other ships that had been sent across. Uh, the captain of the Resolute wasn't perturbed by this at all. He sent out sledding parties to see if he could find any evidence of Franklin, um, but he, he couldn't. But one of the sledding parties came across another ship, HMS Investigator, that had been trapped in the ice for two and a half years. The men on that ship were on half rations and they were virtually starving, so they were very, very happy to see the men of the Resolute. They followed the, the sledding party back to the Resolute and then the captain of the, um, uh, the Resolute wrote a report to his flotilla commander reporting what had happened, saying that they were stuck in the ice but they'd rescued these men from the investigator. The, um, the, uh, the commander, a, a Commodore Bellow, was became very, very concerned by this. He, um, he could see disaster happening and he didn't want his name involved with this pending disaster. So he ordered the captain of the Resolute to abandon the ship uh, and travel overland back to where his two ships were and uh, head back to England. The Resolute captain protested the order um, because he thought he'd be able to make it out in the, when the, the, uh, the ice thawed in uh, the spring, but the order was, was uh, confirmed and uh, he made the ship as ship shape as he could and then he and his men started a very arduous uh, trek across the ice uh, to uh, the other two ships. Now, 18 months later, uh, in September 1855, the Resolute was found by an American whaling vessel 1,200 miles from where uh, she'd been abandoned. Um, the American couldn't believe their luck. This was a, a ship in very good condition. There was no one on board. They could claim the salvage rights, which they did. So they, um, they sailed the ship back to Connecticut, claiming the rights, and then the United States Congress uh, decided to intervene. Um, the US had been at war with Great Britain twice in the previous 80 years, and the, uh, the, US, the Congress wanted to do something to um, become friend, uh, create a better relationship with the United Kingdom. So they purchased a the vessel and renovated the vessel back to its original standard at the cost of 40,000 US dollars, which was a fortune at the time. And then they, they sailed it across the Atlantic and they presented it to uh, Queen Victoria on the 13th of December, 1856. And she came down to the ship herself to ex uh, accept this wonderful gift from the American people. Um, and this was seen by most historians as the start of the special relationship between the United States and the United Kingdom. Now, 25 years later, when the Resolute was decommissioned, um, Queen Victoria ordered that her very, very best timbers be used to create a desk. And this desk was presented to President Rutherford B. Haynes in 1880. And, of course, is the Resolute desk, which has been in the Oval Office ever since. It's been used by most presidents of the United States ever since. So a little bit of, of more history for you. So a bit more, uh, more recent news. In September the, uh, 2014, um, researchers, Canadian researchers, found the wreck of the Erebus, exactly where the Inuit Indians had said it was. And then almost two years to the day uh, later, they found the, uh, the wreck of the terror. Once again, almost exactly where the uh, Inuit Indians had said it was. The, that advice that they'd given, that evidence that they'd given had been ignored for all those years. Um, now, the Canadian government is doing um, lots of research onto these vessels. Uh, it seems that from what they've found so far, is that they became stuck in the ice at the northern end of King William Island and then they either broke free from the ice and drifted down to where they were discovered later on at these locations or they maybe someone was able to sail them down to that location before becoming stuck again. Uh, we don't know, but that's why the research is going on. Uh, the Canadians have made it uh, an area off limits to anyone else uh, and they're just doing that, uh, that research trying to find out what's, what, uh, what happened. Now, largely because of um, Lady Franklin, who wanted to preserve the memory of her husband as, as a great hero, there's been statues to him erected in his native Lincolnshire, um, in Hobart in Tasmania, in Franklin Square in, in Hobart, and of course in London. And we visited the Franklin um, Memorial in London a few months ago, and uh, the inscription says, to the great Arctic navigator and his brave companions who sacrificed their lives in completing the discovery of the Northwest Passage. Now, a little poetic license in all that, because, of course, 
uh, Franklin didn't complete the discovery of the Northwest Passage. That honour went to a, a Norwegian man uh, who some of you might know, Roald Amerson, who was famous for being the first person to reach the South Pole. He didn't, con he considered, he didn't consider the South Pole his greatest achievement. He considered uh, his conquest of the Northwest Passage as his biggest achievement. And he took three years from 1903 to be able to achieve it. He didn't need to, actually. He could have done it in two years. He could have wintered in the ice for one year, uh, but he stayed for another year on purpose. Uh, uh, on that first year when he was stuck in the ice, he went off uh, exploring and he came across a tribe of Inuits and the two parties started helping each other. And um, over that course of that time, uh, Amundsen learnt a great deal about survival in the Arctic conditions from the Inuit, including the caribou fur that he's wearing here. Now, scientists have done tests on this caribou and apparently each individual fibre of fur holds tiny pockets of air, and now air being a great insulator, the best insulator you can get. So even though this is very, very light, it's very, very warm and comfortable to wear. At the time, European explorers were wearing layer after layer after layer of clothing. So they had cotton, then they had wool, then they had canvas, and they had oil skins over the top of them. So it was very, very heavy to wear. It was very uncomfortable. Uh, it, once it was wet, it was very hard to get dry. But this caribou fur was, was fantastic, and Armisen used it for his quest of the South Pole. They also taught him how to handle dog sleds and how to make the, uh, the, the, uh, the sledding much more efficient. If you take water into your, ice water into your mouth and warm it up in your mouth and then spit it onto caribou fur and rub it along the rails or the, the, um, the rails of, of the sleds, then that ices up those sleds and makes them 30% more efficient across the ice. And Armisen used this, all this information that he'd learnt from the, uh, the Inuit to conquer the South Pole on the December 14, 1911. And even though he had set off way behind Scott, he arrived at the South Pole more than a month before Scott and his ill-fated ex, uh, um, expedition. So ladies and gentlemen, that's the story of the Lost Franklin expedition. I hope you've enjoyed that. Um, if you did, I think you'll enjoy the next talk. It's about um, the famous French um, naval officer and explorer La Perouse, who explored more of the Pacific in his one voyage of discovery to the Pacific than Cook did during his three voyages. So hope you come along to that. And people have also asked us how to keep in contact with us after the, um, the cruise is finished. Uh, our Facebook page is Retired Afloat. Uh, if anyone wants to go on that and, and um, uh, keep in contact that way. So ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. Um, see you next time.